governments recently decided to um, add some security feature to their PLC. And uh, today we have uh, Tobias and Ali, and they will be sort of uh, telling us what they managed to find this PLC. Um, they both come from uh, Ruhr University Bochum. Um, Tobias is a, is a recent acquisition as a doctoral student, and Ali is a postdoc. So uh, let's give them a hand. Hmm, where is our slide? Uh, the presentation mode? It's VR. Let's say it again. Yes. Okay. Welcome to our talk, a deep dive into unconstrained code execution in Siemens S7 PLCs. Uh, my name is Ali Abbasi, and as mentioned before, I'm a postdoc at Chair of System Security at Ruhr University, Bochum, and here is my colleague. I am uh, Tobias, or Toby. I'm very glad to be here. It's my fifth time uh, at the Congress, and now finally able to give back in a way, so I'm very excited about that. Um, so let's get into it. So first, about the plan of the talk. Um, we want to give you a little bit of a background of what PLCs, which is Programmable Logic Controllers, are all about. Um, why we might want to use them, in what kind of setting, and then we want to go into the specifics of uh, PLCs uh, in the Siemens case. First, we look a bit about at the hardware and then at the software afterwards and the different findings that we had. Uh, at the end, we will show a demonstration of what we were able to achieve and um, conclude with some remarks. Um, so first of all, process automation. So we all know it, or maybe we do it ourselves, or we know somebody who does it. Um, we put in some uh, devices in our smart home, if we call it smart already. And um, we try to automate different targets, or like, different things, um, to make our lives easier. Things like turning up and down the heat. We might not want to do that our own. Uh, we might not want to overheat or underheat. And what we do is basically have some uh, sensory systems inside our homes, as well as um, some devices that interact with those sensors. In this case, we might have a thermostat and a heater, and we want to adjust our temperature based on the thermostat. There are uh, pretty simplistic um, solutions like this for smart home, but what do we do if we have very complex control loops, for example? Um, here we can see on the left uh, bottom corner um, a pretty complex looking picture, some operating uh, operators sitting in front of what we call an HMI, a human machine interface, uh, which is basically an aggregation of all the information of things that go on in a factory, for example. We need different sensors in um, this factory and we need to uh, steer different motors and stuff like this, so we uh, need things in the middle to kind of control all of this. And we do this uh, using PLCs. Here we can see a setup how it could look like. So basically you have a set of inputs as we talked about and a set of outputs, and we have some logic going on in the middle. And what we typically deploy is a PLC, a programmable logic controller, and some logic in the middle. There are different technologies uh, that can be used, for example, structured text or letter logic, which gets downloaded onto the PLC, and then uh, which steers outputs based on the inputs that it gets. Uh, here we can see some applications of this kind of thing. For example, a chemical power plant, chemical plant, um, uh, an electric grid, or uh, some manufacturing. All of those components are pretty critical to the workings. Even either we see it in the uh, in our everyday lives, and sometimes we don't really see it, but they are in the uh, steering everything in the background. And we really don't want those systems to get compromised. Um, for example, if you went on to Google and uh, looked something about disasters in chemical plants, you could see some melted down plants just because of some mis malfunction in a system or so. And we really don't want this to happen, um, neither on accidental, but also not on a malicious basis. And this is why we want to secure all the processes going on in factories and the like. We've seen some of the recent attacks, so it started kind of uh, in 1999 with the first initial um, reconnaissance uh, 
base mainly. And then we had some more advanced attacks in 2010, for example, where we saw Stuxnet, which was very much a really intricate operation. If you think about it on a technical level, what all went into it, what uh, different uh, skill sets were involved, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive. And then in the more recent time, we had some um, issues in the Ukrainian power grid, which uh, in 2015 and 16, just before uh, Christmas, some lights went out for quite a while in some cities there. So quite a bit of impact. So to give you a bit of uh, impact uh, background on Siemens PLCs here, when it comes to market shares, we can see that together with Rockwell Automation, Siemens actually has more than 50% uh, market share in the market. And obviously, if we tackle some devices that introduce some security, it would be interesting to look at those with the biggest market share. This is what we did here in the Siemens case. Um, here we can see the actual PLC that we will focus on in this talk, which is the Siemens S7-1200 PLC. It's uh, one of the smaller PLCs, not quite the smallest. There is the logo as well, which is more of a um, playing around example. But this is uh, the one that it's still pretty accessible to researchers in terms of costs. So it's like 250 for the PLC. Then if you need a power supply, it can add the same. Um, so as long as you don't break too many, spoiler, we broke quite some, or you don't drop them or something like this, uh, then you're pretty fine. So you can kind of uh, get the resources to play with those devices. Uh, we have different applications, and uh, we talked about them before. So here is what an unboxing of a uh, Siemens S7-1200 PLC would look like. Uh, we have the top view here. On, in the left picture, it's uh, only one of different PCBs, which are layered onto each other in this case. Um, but the real magic uh, goes on in the top PCB, which is uh, the green one that we see here. Uh, looking at it a bit more in more detail, we have the top view on the left side which shows the different components that really make uh, the PLC tick. For example, the ARM CPU that we have or different input outputs uh, that we can connect to PLC, as we talked about before, uh, which they need in order to steer different parts of the system. And then we have the flash chip on uh, the top side as well, which is a, um, a bigger flash chip holding the firmware of the actual um, uh, PLCs, which we will uh, talk about a bit more in detail later. Um, on the flip side, we have on the right picture the bottom side of uh, the first layer PCB. And as we can see here, this is where the bootloader chip resides, which is an SPI flash chip of four megabytes uh, holding the code of the Siemens PLC bootloader. Here we uh, wanted to have a, a detailed view on what the actual processing unit inside this board actually looks like. And what you can do if you want to really want to find out, you can do some uh, decapping. And this is what we see here. Um, the result of this, we can see that uh, at the core of it is, it's a Renesas P, uh, ARM Cortex R4 uh, from 2010. And if you afterwards are more uh, juggling with the software side of things. You may also want to find out the actual revision number, what it supports inside the uh, ARM standard. And what you can do there is use a, a special instruction which uh, resides in the ARM uh, uh, instruction set. And uh, you can decode uh, the different bits on it, which we did here, which you can see here for reference. So if you really want to know what's uh, going on, you can uh, take apart those bits and make sure you're actually working with the hardware that you expect to be working with. <coughs> so uh, here's where we come to the, uh, the memory part of the hardware, and this is where I leave you, give you over to Ali. Thanks. Now that the Tobias like, unboxed the PLC for us, now I'm going to talk about quirks and features in the PLC. Uh, so as mentioned before, it's a Cortex-R4, uh, Revision 3. Uh, it's a big, big Endian uh, instruction set, and it's also only have MPU, so there is no virtual memory, basically. Uh, there are multiple RAM sizes, depending on which year you bought it or which variant of the 71200 you buy. And also multiple um, SPI flash and multiple different types of uh, NAND flashes. Uh, 
The most significant one difference is like in the RAM, which sometimes they use Wingbone and sometimes they use um, uh, Micron Technologies, recently at least Micron Technologies RAM. It's a LPDDR1 RAM. Uh, with respect uh, to SPI flash for bootloader, so it's a, again, depending on the variance, between one to four megabytes uh, uh, SPI flash. Uh, it contains different banks of each size, uh, 512 kilobytes. And uh, basically what the bootloader does is that beside the typical actions of the bootloader, which is like configuring the hardware, is uh, like verifying the integrity of the framework before it being loaded. So we actually did some uh, X-ray tomography of the PLC. Uh, so it's basically 3D, so the PCB is basically rotating here uh, because we wanted to also do some hardware reverse engineering part. And uh, somebody in university had something, so we didn't have to go to our dentist for X-ray. Uh, so here is like a quick 15 minutes uh, X-ray, which is not that good. Uh, but once you go in deep, eventually what you will have is like this. And you can actually just, it's like a software animation. You can go inside PCB and see all layers. It's like amazing. So it has four PCB layer. And uh, so beside VCC and GND, there are two layers of PCB, con PCB connection, basically. So let's look at the startup process. Uh, again, startup as usual. Some hardware configuration happens. Uh, so vector interrupt controller, for example, uh, like lots of these uh, handlers for different modes in ARM. And then CRC checks some of the bootloader itself, which is easily uh, bypassable because you can just overwrite the CRC. Then the bootloader, especially in the 2017, 2018 variant of the Siemens PLC, uh, allows you to overwrite the SPI flash. And uh, also eventually check the CRC check some of the uh, framework before basically loading it. Uh, the size of the bootloader itself is like 128 kilobytes. It's really even less than that because half of it is just like 0xFF. Uh, Siemens multiple times changed. There are different versions. I think in two years we saw like three variants or four variants of the uh, bootloader. So the, it was evolving. It was not something that's everybody forgotten about it. Uh, so generally, as mentioned, so you have hard, the first stage of hardware initialization and uh, then basically uh, bringing the bootloader to the RAM and uh, basically checking the bootloader CRC checksum. So make sure that it's not manipulated, which again, easily can be bypassed. And then a second stage of the hardware initialization happens. And then at this moment, it waits for a specific command for half a second. And if it receives this command, it goes to another mode, which we'll discuss later. Otherwise, it basically prepares some CRC checksum table uh, for the framework. And then it tries to load the framework, and then eventually it just uh, removes the memory barrier, the SY instruction, those who knows about ARM, and basically map the uh, framework to the memory. So <clears throat> the name of the operating system, uh, it was not mentioned before, uh, is Adonis. Uh, uh, we know it from different, from different ways, actually, so first, in the uh, references in the framework, we see lots of references to Adonis, but uh, that was not enough for us. So we actually looked around to see if like, there is any reference to it, and well, LinkedIn is one good open source like, <laughs> reference. And uh, here is like, one employee actually talk about uh, a Siemens developer who talked about like, working in Adonis. I don't know why he put uh, Windows and Linux beside Adonis, but like, he says that like, he worked on this. And uh, so it was not enough for us, so maybe it's some, some OS we don't know. And uh, we look again further and further, and we find this thing, which was the best indicator. So a Siemens developer engineer mentioned, mentioned that he worked on a kernel software development for uh, Adonis real-time operating system, which is a good sign for us. It means that we are right. So now that we know about the naming, and we're sure about that, um, let's look at the components. So. Uh, it's actually a start in uh, basically 440, uh, and basically the, then initializing the kernel, and then uh, lots of routines for initializing different components of the operating system. I don't think Siemens actually generalized it in this way. Uh, we don't have such thing in their framework, but we actually did it like that. So we generalized it to two groups. 
Some of them are core services, like uh, Adonis real-time operating system services, and some of them are related to the op like automation part. So those people who are like in the automation part, like uh, the writing ladder logic and stuff like that, those uh, uh, commands on, and on function codes which are available in Siemens, they actually know it, these are like more automated related services. So you have Profinet, AWP, uh, or automated web programming, MC7 JIT parser, basically, for their ladder logic uh, or different kind of SD, like uh, basically their own um, JIT compiler inside the PLC. And you also have the OMS, this configuration system, which is uh, very related, again, to the automation part, core, core part of the automation system. And of course, Alarm, Central I.O., uh, and uh, stuff like that related to automation. In the operating system part, so lots of these usual things. So file system, so PDCFS, which Tobias talks later about it, uh, uh, the TCP IP stack, uh, some C++ C++ libraries, which is not from Siemens, it's from Dean Conveyor, and uh, Miniweb web server, MWSL parser, or Miniweb scripting language parser, and uh, lots of different subcomponents, which is usual in operating system, like any operating system, you can find them. Uh, also, there are some references to CoreSight. I don't know how many of you know CoreSight or how much you work on ARM, but um, basically CoreSight is something similar to Intel process tracing or Intel PT uh, for tracing applications and uh, can be used for getting code coverage, for example. Uh, and uh, the hardware part is very well documented by Thomas Weber uh, in this year. It's not yet ended this year. So this year, Black Hat Asia. Uh, but I have to warn you, because I received some emails, some people ask about that. Um, if you connect to it, uh, the PLC have some anti-debugging feature, which detects that it's being debugged via JTAG and overwrite the NAND flash with random stuff. So you break the PLC. So just connect it to your own risk. Uh, next is, let's look at the core site just quickly. Uh, core site basically have like, before I go here, I have to mention that Ralph Philip also have a good talk in Zero Nights uh, about core site tracing. So I would recommend you guys go look at that as well. But generally, core site have like three major parts or components, sources, links, and syncs. And syncs is basically the part which you actually get the trace information. And sources are the part which you tell, is a feature in the CPU which you ask what kind of sources you want to get the data from. And then links basically convert these sources. Uh, I have to mention that like lots, it's very useful for fuzzing as well too. I guess some people, very few, but some people are working on that things, on coverage guided fuzzing via core site, ARM core site. So it's possible. Similar implementation has happened in uh, Intel PT, for, for example, KFL, WinAFL, or HongFuzz. So uh, sources, basically they have like Three different components, STM, PTM, ETM. ETM version four is the latest version of it. Uh, <clears throat> and basically you have also links which connects different sources to different, uh, like different or single sources to different or single uh, basically uh, sinks. And then you have funnels for core sites. Uh, sorry, sinks, sorry. Uh, you have syncs, uh, which is basically different kinds. So there are some integrated to the CPU, which is four kilobytes uh, ring buffer SRAM, or uh, you have like uh, system memory or even TPIU or just, for example, JTAG DP port, high speed JTAG port. Uh, <clears throat> so now that we cleared sync, like the core site, uh, we actually queried a uh, seven for existence of core sites. And as you can see, like in the software part, it's already implemented. So uh, they actually have uh, some references in their software that they are utilizing or configuring the core site in their PLCs. And uh, uh, basically, we can see that the ETM version is not the latest version, it is ETM version 3. Now that I talked about core site, Toby can talk about framework dumps. So uh, let's get to something that I'm very much more familiar with and uh, feels easier for me to handle. It's uh, firmware dumps or software in general, but firmware dumps, uh, I think it's closest you can get to uh, what I like when talking to uh, a PLC or trying to understand a PLC. So in the Siemens case, we have a uh, 13 megabytes uh, binary 
And uh, at the beginning, it's not as many, but as if you uh, twiddle around with it a bit and uh, apply some um, IDA Python uh, functions and stuff like this, uh, you can get to like 84,000 functions, which is not something you want to really uh, look at everything manually. Um, also, like a 84,000 function firmware image doesn't really get the sexiest firmware on planet. <laughs> Uh, award, I guess. So, uh, but this is what I what I looked at, and uh, what we will uh, look at a bit more in the next couple of minutes or so. Um, as you can see, we have different names up there. Um, we have one name which is called some gets some max size. So this is my internal way of saying I don't really have a, an idea of what's really going on in this function. But we can also see some more uh, meaningful functions. So we understood some parts a bit more. Uh, some parts a bit less, but I uh, gave it a cursory look at, in most places. So now let's get into a lot of address-related stuff. So we extracted a lot of details, um, which are very interesting if you start looking at firmware code, and I will explain along the way why they might be interesting. So first of all, what you have to know is that Cortex-R4 gives you uh, banked registers. This is basically a feature that's implemented to uh, lower uh, software overhead and allow more seamless mode switches uh, for the internal CPU. And uh, what we get is banked stacks per execution mode. So if we want to know what is kind of going on in, in the state of the firmware at a given point, we may want to look at the different stacks of the different modes. Uh, at any given point. And uh, this is the addresses that we extracted for this. And um, you could use that if you, uh, as a starting point if you started reverse engineering, things like that. Um, now we will have some, address, some tables with addresses. And the first one is um, RAM mappings, which uh, show you what kind of functionality or what you might expect when looking at uh, firmware code. Um, which is interfacing with uh, different parts of memory. So if you initially go and look at some ARM code, you may just see a random access to some place in memory. And you may want to know what it's actually doing. And it looks uh, very uneventful if it's just an address and it uh, gets, um, gets queried and you don't really know what's going on. So for example, if you uh, looked at an address within the text section, you would expect there to reside code. If you wanted to see some global static data, you, want to, you would want to look at the data or the BSS section. And then finally, if you wanted to look at heap memory, look how chunks are set up there, uh, you would look in the uninitialized section. And it goes on like this for different sections. Uh, another very interesting thing to look at if you uh, try to reverse engineer firmware images is that you kind of want to know what the hardware is that a given piece of code is, um, is interfacing with. And in this uh, case, we uh, dumped some regions or reverse engineered what some regions are um, for what is called memory map I.O. And the way ARM is talking to firmware is basically to query a magic value inside the address space and then it gets something back, which is not at all what it has been written there before. So it's basically an address which gets wired through to uh, the peripheral, the hardware peripheral on the same system on a chip. And here we can see that uh, we have different hardware peripherals residing on it. For example, uh, we can talk to uh, the Siemens PLC via different serial protocols. And those protocols might be SPI or I squared C. And we have on the left side, kind of in the middle top, bot, uh, top part of it, um, have some region pertaining to that. And then if you saw some mm, other code talking to timers, for example, you would know you, have, you are in timer land at the moment or like in the scheduler or whatever it would be. Um, finally, we have some um, MPU configurations, which are memory protection unit configurations, as Ali introduced earlier. So what we can see is that um, Siemens is actually applying some of those uh, configurations to protect parts of memory. What we can see, for example, is where whenever the XN, so the execute never bit is set, code is not to be executed within this address region. Or if we have a read-only region, we really don't want to have it overwritten. So it's interesting that uh, they start applying this in practice. Um, here we can see what actually happens 
when uh, the firmware itself boots up. So it uh, turns out the firmware doesn't really want to um, depend too much on what the bootloader did. Probably it's different teams doing different things. And uh, to keep this interface as small as possible, they kind of redo some of the stuff that the um, bootloader code also does. It sets up the vector table for handling interrupts and similar things like that. Then if we get past this initial stage, uh, we actually want to boot the Adonis kernel, which Ali talked about before. Um, so first of all, there is an array of function pointers that gets called, one for like every piece of functionality that we saw in this overview of the different components of Adonis. So uh, if you wanted to look at what kind of components are there or functional components are there, uh, this is a very interesting uh, list of functions, function handlers to, uh, uh, to examine. It also sets up some management structures and stuff like this, what a typical operating system would have to set up. So now we look at more of the different components of Adonis. First one is the file system. So PLCs, uh, part of the specifications, sometimes it's how uh, resilient is it against temperatures. How low of a temperature can I uh, have this um, PLC reside in without losing functionality? And uh, in this case, what they also want to provide is some safety against um, uh, interrupts in power supply. So they developed a proprietary file system, which is called Power Down Consistency File System, which they implement in the firmware. And um, we can also see one of the uh, one of the work experience uh, entries of one of the previous Siemens uh, employees who stated that he or she worked on uh, this file system. Uh, we have another part, very critical part of the um, functionality, of course. We want to talk to the PLC. It wants to talk to us. In, uh, and one of the ways is uh, obviously TCP IP. And this is uh, to expose the web server, for example, and different other components. And th in this uh, case, it turns out that Siemens doesn't implement their own, which probably is a good idea not to do that. Um, they uh, use inter-niche technologies, the TCP IP stack in version 3.1. If you are good at Googling, you can uh, find some source code and you can actually map this to the firmware and how it works. So it could give you um, some wrapper functions, something like creating sockets and stuff like this. And it uh, could make it easier for you to find those in the firmware image. Um, we also have one of the very critical um, components of uh, each firmware is update. If it allows an update, and uh, the Siemens PLC allows updates. There are different modes. Uh, one of the modes is just you drag and drop uh, a UPD file, an update file, uh, to the web server, and it will uh, start checking uh, firmware integrity and signatures and so on. And the second way is doing it via an SD card, which has a great total of 24 megabytes. And uh, for the low price of 250 euros, you can, can get it. I think you cannot really beat that, uh, that ratio. Um, if you actually decompress this kind of uh, UPD file, you, you get another representation of it in memory. And we did some reverse engineering on that. And we have different fields. I'm not sure if you can see them now, but you can uh, expect what it is. It's uh, different offsets into the actual binary file. It's, um, it's an entry point into the firmware a magic header to make sure something is not too screwed up and uh, CRC over the whole thing, for example. Um, we also extracted some of the addresses inside the firmware image, uh, which help you um, find a first foothold into what the logic is uh, dealing with and uh, give you some addresses for you to re refer this to later. Um, the next component that we uh, want to touch on is MiniWeb, which is the web server. It kind of exposes to you the different internal parts of uh, the PLC and what the state of different GPIOs, general purpose input outputs is, the inputs and the outputs, and uh, what the health of the PLC is itself. And the way that it exposes this is using the MWSL language, mini web uh, scripting language. It's, as we will see on the next, over the next slide, um, I will talk to the, about that in a little bit more detail. We have a, it uh, be started 
as a service as well from one of the function handlers uh, of the Adonis initialization functions that uh, I referred to a little bit before. So now let's get to some undocumented HTTP handlers, which I think are <laughs> very interesting. I think my favorites are li 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 and lo 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 lo. And uh, if, you, if you put those together in a clever way, maybe somebody is musically uh, gifted and can make a song out of it, I would uh, be very interested to, to hear that. Um, so now let's get to the MWSL, the Minimap Scripting Language. So it basically exposes the internal functionality by allowing you to inject into an HTML page via templating different configuration parameters and stuff like this. For example, um, as we can see here on the top right corner, uh, you can see the CPU load uh, of the system at a given time. It doesn't really seem to perform uh, any output encoding, so it's kind of trusting what comes out. Um, so there may be clever ways to, uh, to do some web-related trickery with this. And uh, also the parsing of this tokenization is kind of complex. I looked into it uh, a bit, and uh, this implementation could also be interesting to look at. But we will get to um, this kind, those kinds of aspects a bit later. Um, with this, uh, <laughs> we want to get to our actual findings and talk about those a bit more. And this is where Ali will take over. Thanks, Toby. <laughs> so, um, so now we talk about the capa capabilities which exist in the bootloader, which allows us to have unconstrained code execution. So uh, basically, this feature is available in the UART. Uh, so you need physical access to the device. Uh, but once you have this physical access, you can basically, um, as Tobias later described, we can actually bypass the security ecosystem which developed by Siemens uh, in their product. Uh, so you need UART access. As it's documented here, you have TX, RX, and GND uh, in the PLC. And uh, <clears throat> the UART actually in previous research was documented as well. Uh, every address which I'm talking about here or mentioned in this presentation uh, are for bootloader version 4.2.1. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Siemens actively <coughs> modified this, their bootloader. So I think in two years we saw like two, three modifications or different versions of their bootloader coming up. Uh, so this exactly is based on that half a second waiting for a specific command after a second hardware configuration happens. Uh, it applies to Siemens S7-1200, including C+, and s 7 uh, 200, smart. Actually, somebody from Kaspersky ICS security mentioned it. We didn't know even about it. We just knew, we just investigated S7-1200. But Siemens later updated their advisory that it also applies to other products as well. Uh, <clears throat> so let's talk about this uh, special access feature. Uh, so as we mentioned, uh, one of the things Bootloader does is actually initialize the hardware. And after this hardware, it's basically copy some of the contents of the bootloader itself to uh, a, a memory segment called IRAM, basically. And uh, then PLC basically waits half a second for a specific command. And once it's received this specific command, it responds with a specific string. And it's all happening over the UART. So it's, uh, if you send a, a magic string MFGT, or, uh, Sorry for my broken German, but probably it means mit freundlichen Großen. I hope I did it right. <laughs> uh, and then the PLC responds with dash CPU and says that now you are in this special access mode. I am waiting for your commands. And, uh, and these addresses are also available at 0x EDF8 in the bootloader. Uh, so here is a decoding of our a client, which we release later. Uh, uh, next year, actually, uh, which you see that uh, 2D435055, which is dash CPU response from the, from the PLC. So now we are in it. And also, we also added some extra thing about uh, UART packet format, somebody asked before. So once you send this command, you get lots of uh, functionalities. Here in this presentation, we call them handlers. And uh, basically, there are something we call primarily handler. It's uh, like 128 entries. And uh, there are some three other separated handlers, which are like 0x AT, UART configuration, and BY. <clears throat> so 
in the primary handler list, there are lots of things. So if you go back to the two previous slides, I got the, the framework version here, 423. Uh, <coughs> and uh, basically, what is happening is that basically it's this command here, get bootloader version. We are just requesting the via special access feature to tell us what is the bootloader version. And uh, also you can do lots of uh, low level diagnostic functionalities happening there. Also some functionalities related to uh, framework update happening there, uh, which bypasses the usual uh, cryptographic verification of the framework. <coughs> and it doesn't need that. So <coughs> let's look at them because uh, for this work which we are talking about, we actually primarily only use two of the handlers. So we don't use, we don't look at like, or we don't discuss now all others 128 handlers which exist in the PLC. So how it works. One of the handlers, the interesting one for us, was uh, handler 0x80, which mentioned here, update mode function. So basically what it does is that it, it lets you, allow you to write to a specific part of the memory, IRAM, which previously copied some content, content of the bootloader. So basically you send this handler after this handshake, you have to do this MFGT1 and then CPU, and then basically you are going to send this handler, and then it basically checks, because each handler might have different requirements, check number of arguments, for example, and then you are in this update function mode. <clears throat> and then you have to provide target ID, because there are four sub-functionality available once you enter this mode. And some of them are like for IRAM, for SPI or IOC, or for Flash. And uh, then for each of them, you have to choose what kind of operation you want to do. You want to config, read, write, or check. And uh, so you can do all of these things. So you can read and write uh, to the IRAM, basically. This is a function handler like 0x80. Next is a primary handler like 0x1c. This is listed in this handler list uh, here. So, <clears throat> So basically, it allows you to call functions. So uh, they, they, basically, these functions are listed in the IRAM. And uh, basically, what you do is that you send this handshake. You are, and you are in this, uh, basically, this 0x1c handler. And then you can call the ID number of the handlers which you want to use. So here, you have like lots of handler available for 0x1c. <clears throat> so the question is, what we can do with it? And before I ask Tobias, Want to ask anybody here of any idea? Trace. trace. Somebody said trace. I don't know what that means, but. Just uh, look what is happening on the controller. OK. You mean with, Jade, with the core side? Yeah. No, we are not going to use that. So let's ask Tobias what he can do. Yeah, so uh, looking at it dynamically and uh, seeing what it does with the memory is I guess a good idea in general if you, if like static reverse engineering doesn't give you anything. In this case, um, we looked through different, or I looked through different um, of those functions and tried to see what can I do with it. So the base of where I started looking for this uh, um, special access feature was basically that I saw there is too much in this code going on. I kind of feel like I understood what it should be doing, the bootloader, what, should, what it should be doing, but um, it seemed just to be too much. And uh, the way we can combine those two uh, functions is basically to, um, in recap, um, use this OX1C handler, which gives us control over um, what kind of secondary list functions are to be called, which, as we saw before, is copied during the the boot up process to a position in IRAM from actual read-only memory. And this exposes um, this function handler table to uh, anything that can write to IRAM. And as we learned before, the OX80 handler is um, able to, in a limited capacity, do just that. And uh, here we can see what we can uh, try to do with this. So if we use, in the first stage, the OX80 handler to uh, right to IRAM, we can actually inject another function pointer together with uh, some configuration values that allows us to pass different checks about argument sizes and stuff like this. Um, we can inject this as an entry into this table, and we can also write to this table a payload, um, which we uh, 
uh, can use as a shellcode. And then in the second stage, we can use this previously injected uh, index that we um, specified just as a trigger to call our own payload. So uh, now we have code execution in the context of the bootloader, so which is uh, as privileged as we can get at that point, and uh, we can see what we can play around with this. And um, as a um, little summary is that we chain all this together and we get code execution, and with Ali's words, with this technology, we're going to rocket the PLC. And um, before we go into what this actually allows us to do, is uh, a little word about the stager payload. So I wrote this, um, this chain of uh, different invocations, and it turns out that this write to IRAM is somehow a bit very slow in the first place, but then also error prone, so it, the device can just error out. I'm not quite sure what this pertains to, but it would maybe be interesting to know from a Siemens uh, engineer. Um, but it, basically led to me having to inject a little encoded payload which just has a little subset of bytes um, which gives us an interface to do to perform more uh, performant uh, reads and writes with an arbitrary write primitive and then use this to inject second stage payloads and uh, this is what we want to demonstrate here. Thanks. So now we will have our demo, four demos actually. So the first one is actually just seeing the communication, uh, basically sending this request and getting a response and basically sending the stager payload. So in the up is the raw UART communication. Don't worry, it's getting zoomed later. Uh, <clears throat> and in the down is like our client, which actually talking with the PLC and sending these commands. Uh, <clears throat> so we are just running our UART. And here is we are sending our command. And if you look at in the up, you see that dash CPU signal came from the PLC. And now we are sending our stager, and a stager just send us just one acknowledgement, so we know that uh, a stager runs successfully. This is for framework version, bootloader version 421, basically. So now we are going to do something else. We are going to actually dump the framework from a running PLC and compare it with the framework downloaded from Siemens website. <coughs> so First, we are going to actually unpack the framework downloaded from Siemens website because it's a compressed uh, bit LZP3. So <coughs> that's what we are going to do, I hope. Ah, oh, no, we are actually setting up our SSL connection first. So SSL port, forward, port forwarding, uh, SSH port, port forwarding before, and we are just checking that the PLC is running uh, properly. So like, this is not a broken PLC or something like that, so that we wrote something, so we just make sure that the web server is opening, we uh, open the web server, yeah, it's open, good. And uh, also try to log in uh, <coughs> to, the web to the web server of the PLC, just again, make sure that the PLC is functional. So also enter the password, I guess everybody can guess it. And, uh, <coughs> And then, so you see that we log in eventually, and in the left side, you see all the like, functionalities which load related to the PLC. So it's a working, running, functional PLC. And uh, so now we are going to decompress the framework downloaded from Siemens website after uh, checking for export license and stuff. Uh, so they want to make sure that people from Iran and North Korea don't get it. I'm from Iran, by the way. Uh, <laughs> So here we have the unpacked framework, but because the framework is very large, as Tobias mentioned earlier, uh, what we are going to do is that we are just going to export 256 kilobytes of the framework from some part of the web server and uh, in the IDA. So we have to set the big NDNS for the CPU and also rebase the framework. So as you can see here, there is no function yet, but once you rebase it, you have all the functions as well. And uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so then we got just go and export 256 kilobytes from the framework. So we specifically slow down the UART because we want to make sure that we don't do it too fast to overflow the buffer which we have internally in the PLC. So, uh, so here, for example, in this address, um, 691E28, we are going to export 250, 256 kilobytes. This is from the framework, Siemens framework, right? So we just export it. So, yeah, so it's now called FW, 
0x691e28 in the folder out. So now we are done with this part. We are going to dump the same address in the PLC, so from a running PLC. Uh, I have to mention again, so this is the top part is basically raw UART, and this is basically our client part. And we are dumping it via cold boot style attack. So we are basically resetting the PLC, and before it overwrite the RAM, we are basically dumping the content of the RAM. So this is the address, 691E. This was the same address, basically. And we are dumping 256 kilobytes. And uh, here, we send MFGT1, basically, and then got the dash CPU, and then the rest of the stager and stuff goes. <coughs> so now, uh, basically, we are uh, sending packet and eventually get a receive. So basically, got all the uh, payload, like, dumped in mem dump 691E28, basically. So this is from the RAM of the PLC. This is not anymore uh, from Siemens websites. We are just SCP'd to our own machine and then compare it. So now we have the mem dump and the original framework 256 kilobyte each. And then we are going to compare them with each other. And as you can see, should look here. Like, uh, you have like 100% match, meaning that it's exactly the same framework which is available in Siemens website. We dumped it directly from the Siemens uh, PLC memory uh, using this special access feature. So, let's do another one. So this time we are want to show that unconstrained code execution in just a very basic way. So we are actually just writing a custom payload to the PLC and uh, get a hello or greetings from the PLC. So basically, basically, we just ask the PLC to send us this message all the time. <clears throat> so again, uh, so we are sending our custom payload uh, right here. It's a hello loop. And uh, basically, the PLC just sending this loop for us. So all of these things, again, R4 bootloader 421, we have to readjust certain things because Siemens, I think they updated again the bootloader in the recent uh, 2019 December, which we bought new PLC again, once again. And now here we get a response uh, that the PLC is sending basically to us. These are raw data which PLCs keep sending to us. That's showing that we are receiving this. But maybe this was too basic. <coughs> Uh, again, these are the raw data which we are getting from the PLC. Let's actually do it a little bit more complex, show something that is not from us. So let's play a game called tic-tac-toe inside the PLC. <laughs> and I guess if you don't know, this is how tic-tac-toe is. Like, this is I'm playing and I just draw with the Google. Uh, so now we are again are going to send our uh, custom payload, but this time we are just use partial code from somebody else uh, from the internet and just upload, compile it, and then upload it to the PLC. Uh, obviously, you have to readjust lots of things there, but uh, so we are uh, sending our payload, including a stager, and uh, these are the raw data again. These are our client, and uh, <coughs> eventually you will see a tic-tac-toe interface which you have to enter. So player one is actually playing with the X, and player two is playing with like zero. So you see when you position which you choose, like you have X, X, and hopefully player one wins. Yes, so and that was it. So that was a demo. Uh, <laughs> uh, Obviously, like, there are lots of other ideas which we can work on, on injecting other custom code using this special access functionality. We are still working on this. Uh, like, lots of other things on Siemens. We are sorry, Siemens, we are just working on this. But uh, uh, there are more to come. But in the meantime, there are some ideas for other people in case they are looking into this and uh, want to investigate security of Siemens PLCs. Um, so using this special access entry, you can do some certain things. So for example, you can uh, use the special access functionality to write to um, 
uh, the framework. As we mentioned, this functionality is available and it doesn't require those cryptographic signature which normally during update process of the framework available. So you can just bypass that and it's just CRC checksum. So what you can do is that, for example, adding an entry uh, to Adonis uh, uh, like initialization routine, which is available. And then, uh, or also you can do it before Adonis initialization routine, uh, which we call internal, internal TH initial. Uh, another one which we can do, if you remember, Tobias talked about some undocumented layer and lots of uh, creativity and creating music, li, 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 lo, lo, lo. Uh, so what one person can do is like basically adding a specific handler or overwriting existing handler. And what it makes actually is like something like Tritone. I don't know if anybody know, heard about Tritone. It's a malware which were attacking Petrorabic in Saudi Arabia. So they were trying to do it in a TCP, but attacker here can maybe do it in HTTP example and just listen and waiting for commands. And also uh, other alternatives like patching one of the jump tables in the AWP uh, <coughs> handlers. Uh, which can be also used for process a specific attack. So, what else is out there? So what we looked is, uh, we looked at attack surface in the Siemens S7 PLCs. Uh, uh, there are like, for, from perspective of local privilege attacks, what we, can, what we looked was bootloader. We are still working on hardware attacks and some hardware software attacks on the edge uh, is still ongoing work which, uh, we don't obviously discuss now. Uh, also interesting thing, I think if somebody who is interested in security of PLCs and especially internals, I'm not talking about like this general segregation of network and stuff like that in ICS, I'm talking about more advanced, low level stuff. Uh, we think like MWSL is an interesting target. <clears throat> there, are, there probably are some like bugs in their implementations. Also with respect to file system parsing and framework signing, there are probably some stuff. And also MC7 JIT parser, basically, which they have from uh, privilege escalation perspective. And uh, also from remote code execution perspective, uh, both uh, mini web, web server and also uh, <coughs> any network access accessible services which they have uh, might be interesting. We are actually also looking at this part right now. So <coughs> as a conclusion, uh, PLCs are becoming more complex. That's true, because they are actually providing more and more features. And because of this more complexity, there will be more bugs. We can see, for example, in the MWSL, which we are looking at now. Uh, <clears throat> also, um, vendors try to basically more make it more complex. They have uh, basically some anti-debugging, which we just discussed in Siemens PLCs. <clears throat> but also, they have, uh, for example, framework integrity verification, uh, so the signed framework, like, uh, like upload to the PLC and stuff like that. So they are making it more complex. But uh, what, what we have to know is that uh, if in their uh, like threat model, which like lots of people make, or this uh, security ecosystem which they built, uh, if they have a feature which undermines the same security ecosystem which they designed, I mean, they, I think it's obvious that they have to remove. Like with the case of bootloader case in the special access feature, it is one of the good examples. <clears throat> so, and of course, customers also have to know because if they have such feature and they need it, as long as customers know, it's fine. But when they don't, they can't risk calculate this risk in their strategy or in this uh, threat model which they have. So, and also they have to uh, think about rethink about security via op security. Maybe they allow us, for example, as researchers, to access their devices better and easier to investigate it more. We are still doing it, but it's just taking longer. Uh, and I believe that there are lots of things more to be done on like PLCs. Um, and Siemens will, need, will not be the last one which we are working on. Uh, so we have to thank some people, uh, Torsten Holtz, our supervisor who is not here, uh, Thomas, Alexander, Marina, Lucian, Nikita, and Robin for their help uh, in their work. And, uh, and now we are going to answer questions. If Thank you. So, yeah, feel free to line up in front of the microphones um, or write your questions in uh, the Eliza room. Ah, oh, there you go. 
It's all the way down there, I think. No? Hello? Yeah. So there's one question from the internet. Uh, did you check the MC7 parser? If yes, uh, did you find any hidden unknown uh, s machine 7 instruction on it or something? Uh, so you want to answer? I answer. It's fine. So just, uh, is it recorded or I have to repeat it again? So they ask that if we check the it's MC7 right. parser. Oh, okay. So it's fine. So um, we didn't like truly investigate the MC7 parser, but we are working on it right now. Yeah, hello. Uh, how were you able to find the uh, MFG security password? Oh, that's a very long story. First of all, like we had, we had it in front of us for a long, long time until Siemens introduced this anti-debugging feature. And after that, uh, like we had to find other ways, other means uh, to find it, to find like similar function, like similar ways that allow us because one thing which we didn't discuss here is that we didn't t tell you about how we, for example, executed that instruction uh, before in the PLC. It was involved uh, some works uh, which we received help from some researchers in Netherlands and in France. Uh, so this, this, is, this was something informed by Siemens in 2013, I think. They knew about it, but until 2016, they patched it and then uh, it became a, like basically they tried to protect their PLCs from this kind of attack. It was never published before. So we were using it and we don't want to talk about it because the original author didn't want to talk about it, but we replicated what they were, that, what they were doing. And then um, once we really had to look for other ways, like then it opened our eyes that there are some other functionalities as well there, so f such as for example, bootloader. But before we, before we need it, like, we never actually looked at this thing. So it was, like, in front of us for, like, two years. And Maybe uh, one interesting piece of a background story on this is that we actually, in the previous technique that we used, we actually overrode the conditional jump that would lead to this special access feature being executed with an unconditional jump. So we basically cut out 60% of the whole code of the firmware image by accident. And then I just, uh, because of the hunch, uh, that I was talking about before, that there is just too much functionality. I revisited it and actually uh, realized that it was exactly this spot that we uh, overrode before, and we had to basically replace it and um, use it for our own sake. Is, is there any boot time security other than the CRC check? So do you, are you able to modify the contents of the spy flash and get arbitrary code execution that way as well? Uh, so... Depends in which year you are talking about. 2017, 2016. So we are talking about the same models of the PLC, but in 2017 and 2018, no. So you could basically just take out SPI flash, overwrite it, and that was fine. But if you were overwriting and it caused um, a halt in the CPU core, it would again trigger that anti-debugging technology which they have with, with this watchdog, basically. Uh, but from like frameware integrity verification, uh, well, basically, once you write to, the framework is written to the NAND flash, well, it's just a CRC checksum. But during the update process, no, there are some cryptographic check. But once it's written, no. There are some problems which there, which, again, it's a still ongoing work, and we don't want to discuss about it, but nice catch. Thank you. Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, could you elaborate on your communication with the vendor and the timeline? Yes. Uh, so first of all, we know about this problem for like one year and a half before we report it to the vendor. And the primary reason was that we were using it for some other project. This, this, actually, this result is actually from a site project rather than the main project, because the main project is still something else and it's still ongoing. Uh, but from the side of that project, uh, we had that access. And because we were worried that reporting to the vendor, they can't fix it with software update and then do not allow all other CVEs which we find from this other project. We didn't want to. Eventually, at 2019, uh, Thomas Weber wanted to talk about his talk on the, like, basically this JTAG uh, interface with, for CoreSight. And then we decided to actually talk about it as well. But um, other than that, we actually talked in June, I think, with Siemens. And uh, they confirmed that there is this hardware-based special access feature. 
and they, are they say that they are going to remove it. And uh, that was it. We also sent them a, a write-up for them to, to read. So there is one last question from the Signal Angel over there. Yeah. So there's another question from the internet. Um, if tools like Flash ROM doesn't have support for unknown SPI Flash ROM chip, then how do you ex usually extract firmware if you don't want to decap chip or use SOIC8 socket? Uh, can you repeat it again? I didn't get the question. Did you? If tools like Flash ROM does not have support for unknown SPI Flash ROM chip, uh, then how do you ex usually extract firmware if you don't want to decap chip and use SOIC8 socket? So first of all, we never actually decapped the SPI flash. So um, that's we just did it for the CPU. And just because we, want, we know that Siemens re relabel their PLC, so it's not their own CPU, it's from Renaissance, but uh, that's why we did the decapping. So story of decapping, setting it aside. But uh, from other things, so basically there are still this functionality, this bootloader functionality, which actually lets you read the content of the memory. So that's one thing you can read. Obviously, you don't even need that, thanks to one of my students. Um, we now know that actually you don't even need to take out the uh, bootloader chip. We basically can just connect directly in the board and dump the, the framework. Um, Marcelo, that's his name, I forgot his name. He's here actually, but anyway, so uh, you can just directly read it. And uh, yeah, I don't think the reading part, especially some part of it is protected, especially in the, in the recent versions, which you can't read everything. But uh, beside that, I don't think there is any hardware now yet. Or I, I'm sure that they are working on that. And we are working also on something to bypass that. So. OK, that was all. Next talk is going to be about delivery robots. Sasha, in 20 minutes. So let's give Thank them you. a hand. Thank you for attending.